Yeah, and just to be fair, I, I would never trade that time of my life for anything. Uh, you know, cultural insights, languages. Uh, I, I got to do so many very fulfilling things for me as a person, and I, I hoped I was helping some other people at some of these volunteer projects. And then it just became apparent all the things you said. You know, I, I, I occasionally saw like a hippie couple with their, you know, barefoot four-year-old and it felt like that could be me. You know, now I've got a five-year-old and a two-month-old and it's just, it's just not going to work. Like I I still need to play catch-up game to try to uh, hope to buy a house one day for my kids so you can go to a good school. Uh, So if I had put it off even another couple of years, we'd, we'd be in a bad situation. Hello and welcome to the Working From Home podcast with your host, me, Nelson Jordan. Today, I'm delighted to be joined by Greg Heilers. He's the co-founder of Jolly SEO, who, if you don't know them already, are an editorial link building agency, so very much within the SEO world. Greg, thank you so much for joining us. Oh, Thank you for having me, Nelson. No, no problem at all. I think you've got a fascinating story. Um, very much not the uh, not the expected, um, but I think yeah, I think people are going to get a lot from this, not just from the travel aspects that we talk about today, um, and, and the cultural aspects, but also kind of how you found your way within digital and the, the different kind of um, channels and, and methods that you tried out. So I guess let's just uh, let's just dive in. So right now. You're based in China. Um, so I'd like to discover how that happened. So if you could go kind of right back to the beginning and talk us through that, that would be fantastic. In the end of 2013, start of 2014, I was in Guatemala. Uh, I was in a place called Shela. Uh, the long name is Quetzaltenango. And I was, I guess, unbeknownst to me, ending a six to seven year period of what we might call a, being a volunteer, like volunteerism. Mm-hmm. Uh, I was traveling around the world, doing internships, apprenticeships, volunteering, some for three months, some for nine months, some for weeks. And I met a woman and we, you know, we hiked up the tallest mountain in Central America together, you know, classic, you know, we extended our stay in the city. Uh, and then it got to the point where I was supposed to go to Rome for a culinary internship and she needed to go back home to China. And she said, or you could come live with me in China. And I said, yeah, okay, I'll, I'll do that instead. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and that was the end of my days doing like hands-on farm work, conservation work, and the start of why we ended up connecting today. Uh, digital, digital has been my, my means of work for the past six years. Mm-hmm. So this, uh, this, this girl you met at the time, was she Chinese? Yes, um, she's Chinese, and we're in her hometown now, Hefei. It's about three hours west of Shanghai. Mm-hmm. Fantastic. So it was very much not your not your plan. Um, no. What would you uh, What would you have done? Do you think if you hadn't met her, would you have carried on with the kind of volunteerism or gone down a different route? You know, that's a good question. I think I was I was probably aging out of it um, anyway. Uh, I, I was 27 ish, and I remember a guy probably in his maybe 40. We, we, I was living in a house of about six or seven bedrooms in Shayla, an old colonial house. It was awesome. It was $100 a month. Um, and this guy gave me unsolicited advice. He said, Do your internship in Rome, and if the love is real, you know, it would wait for you. And I just watched him say goodbye to someone. And this person went back to Korea and I thought, oh man, in 10 years from now, I don't want to be, be doing that. So um, I think it, it's a real burnout factor. I don't know if people talk about that a lot in, uh, in the travel life, but you make these temporary relationships. And I think I was, I was growing out of it a bit. I, just, I wasn't looking for a long-term relationship, but when the potential 
for a genuine one came up, I think I realized all of a sudden, like, why would I throw away that chance this time around? Um, so that, that didn't quite answer your question, but I think for me, it was more like, oh, this is it. I don't, I don't think I had it. This is it until that came up. Sure. I mean, yeah, I, I'm very much of the opinion and this isn't necessarily where I thought, I thought we'd go at this time in the podcast. (laughs) Right in. Yeah. It's well, it's well worth saying. I think, um, finding the right partner, um, I still think not enough people are putting the right emphasis on it. Um, Mm. it is, I think the most important part of a happy life. Um, you know, there'll be others that disagree that say, okay, well, you should try and be happy on your own with independence. And I think there's, there's obviously some truth to that. You have to be the sort of person that other people like to be around and, uh, you know, enjoy being around by working on yourself. But at the end of the day, I think like the partner that you choose has more impact on the quality of your life than any other decision, like than career, than your location, than you know what you what you do on a day to day basis. So yeah, I'm I'm completely with you there. I'm I'm very much of the opinion if you get a shot at happiness through relationships, then I I would go for that over any other kind of career career path career options. I suppose. I agree. Take it. I mean, and again, it's probably not the focus of our conversation. However, this person is so supportive for my work. So it, it is integrated there. I mean, they're, they're part of it. You know, uh, we could talk about that, you know, going freelance. I only felt so comfortable because my partner had a salary job. So that, that was another part of it. But again, we don't need to go down that rabbit hole if that's not, not what we're supposed to go yet. No, I'd, I'd love to. I might just delay it a little bit because there's some things that I want to ask you uh, about Guatemala, like obviously you worked in uh, on these uh, the conservation projects on on the farms. Um, how did you get involved in that? Was that something that you were familiar with from from back home? My father's family in Indiana, in the United States, they all have a farming background, um, so I did grow up around that. And for several years, I'd worked on organic farms uh, and also some conservation projects. Uh, one in in Palestine, one in Scotland. Um, so it's, so it's here and there. Uh, and I had been to Guatemala that time, the first time working at an orphanage, you know, like a caretaker. Uh, I actually wanted to work on their farm cause they had a farm. Uh, the last thing I wanted to do was live with 25 kids <laughs> aged four to seven, uh, and be their caretaker, but that's what I did. Uh, and but the second time around, I, I really stuck to my guns. Um, to be quite honest with you, I was taking advantage of the expat lifestyle. The conversion ratio was really good. Mm-hmm. Um, I could practice my Spanish. I could uh, learn a little bit of the local languages. Guatemala has a lot of languages. Uh, and it's a really beautiful... Guatemala is split. The east is all lowland Caribbean. And the west is all highlands, dry mountains. Uh, so mm-hmm. it's, it was really gratifying to go to the highlands that time. Uh, so that, I, yeah, for me, the internet has always been a great resource. I'd find these things on the internet. I'd find, like I mentioned, a hundred dollar a month lodging in a colonial style, like 200 year old house in downtown and just rent it for a month for a hundred bucks. And it, it couldn't get any better at mm-hmm. the time. Within, uh, within your, your farming background then and your, your, your father's family, what sort of farming had they traditionally been involved in? Oh, great question. Um, so they were, by the time my generation comes around, they, they were doing like your typical Midwest corn, soybeans. Um, but when my dad was a kid, things were a little more diversified. Uh, so they had animals. Uh, my dad today, and I helped just as I was kind of closing out that period of my life, set up his retirement farm. He has a, what we call grass-fed uh, beef. And uh, his goats are not necessarily for meat, but they're more for breeding. Um, so it's a, it's a pedigree thing. Uh, and, and they are for meat. They're not milk goats. But um, that's mostly what they do. You know, Everything else is smaller for self-consumption. But they're, they're a grass-fed based animal operation. 
Sure. Okay. So that's that's more around the the animal side than than crops, for example. Yes. Yeah. I had focused a lot on organic, small scale, like hands on uh, perennial, uh, perennials and annuals. You know, mm-hmm. vegetables. But my dad is a classic um, American <laughs> seven year old guy. He's a he loves his beef, and so that. That that's been his dream, you know. So that 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 was interesting to close out my hands-on ag time, working on an operation that really wasn't necessarily what I wanted to do. Mm-hmm. Um, I was studying something called permaculture, mm-hmm. and so that's when I was in Guatemala to to work on their conservation. It was a reforestation project near Shela, um, and it wasn't really permaculture, but for me to work with local people in their ecosystem, it's a, just a unique opportunity to learn uh, cultivation and management that I don't mean to be cliche, but as a Westerner, as an American in a country where we're relatively new to it, um, we're so out of touch with local management techniques. I mean, they're just, we don't know them. They're, they're just not on the books. So to go to other communities and work with people for me was something I desired as like hands-on learning opportunities. Sure. What's the, what's the main concept behind permaculture? Yeah. As far as I understand, you're, you're talking to a guy who's like seven years removed now, right? But um, <laughs> that, the idea is, although it's a lot of work initially, um, you're supposed to be creating systems that become more and more permanent and self-sustaining. So, you know, it's a lot of hands-on work but for example, they have something called food forests. So unlike what we call monoculture, where there's these long rows of single crops, mm-hmm. you have uh, height, like tiered crops. So you've got shade trees doing one crop and something else under it and something else under it and something else under it. And these are hands-on and the harvests are delayed by multiple years when you get into agroforestry. But the idea is eventually these systems can work together. So it's a lot of inter interplanting, like intercropping, you know, beneficial stuff, um, integrated pest management. Uh, that's it's these kind of systems thinking where five, ten years from now, you won't be doing weeding because the weeds are things you would eat or the animals would eat. Like you don't you don't need to do human labor doing that. But there's a lot of human labor up front. That's not to say it's some, you know, hands-off system. Sure. So I, I mean, as far as I understand it, and just correct me if I'm, uh, I've misunderstood it. Then it's about creating an ecosystem of plants and animals and bacteria that that work together um, to kind yeah. of create this sustaining uh, crops, I guess, as opposed to monoculture, which is very much reliant on a lot of human and chemical intervention because the when you've got a, a single crop that uses up a lot of the chemicals in the soil be it kind of nitrogen or phosphorus and you have to end up replacing those di- directly with um with with whatever it is um and i think a lot of that doesn't a lot of that have problems um like running off into rivers um, creating like these oxygen uh, dead zones. That's right. um, so that, that's super interesting. I think I, I'm going to make sure uh, she should be listening anyway. But I'm going to make sure my sister, <laughs> my sister listens to this episode just because she's she's very interested in in that kind of world as well. And she's a, she's a teacher actually, but she's always wanted to move into kind of like outdoor education schools, um, forestry schools, and and that sort of thing as well. Um, so I think oh, she- I love the concept for for children. I mean, I think um, in a in another, you know, how I envisioned when I would have kids, uh, they would they would be outside learning that way. Uh, and then, of course, you know, life teaches you different things along the way. So it, it may not happen that way, but I definitely get my guy in the in the little raised beds we have in California when I can. Uh, so amazing, cool. So. I, I guess just to, to summarize so far, you've obviously got the projects that you were doing all over the world, um, like a, a lot of organic and conservation. 
And then you, uh, obviously Palestine and Scotland and then uh, Guatemala. And then you you met this wonderful woman and she asked you to, uh, was it to move to Beijing? Yeah, so she was doing, you know, classic um, people in their 20s move to the big city, uh, pursue the career. Um, she had her own cool story. You know, she when Beijing hosted the Olympics, she was an English language radio host for like a U.S radio station uh, during the Olympics. Um, she had she had some really cool gigs she did there. Uh, and then she she made remote work work for her eventually. Um, she worked in the travel industry, which is dead a few months a year. And she told her boss, just don't pay me those three months and I'll be back and you accept me back uh, and let me travel for three months. Uh, and he said, yeah, win-win. Uh, so that's how we had the opportunity to meet. So she took three months off to go learn Spanish um, and travel through Central America. And I interrupted her trip. You know, she extended her stay in Guatemala. Uh, and then she invited me to Beijing. And it was very, very thoughtful of her. Um, it was very safely planned. You know, she had a spare room so that if we had a falling out, that I'd have some time. I was coming off my volunteerism stint, so I had like this much money in the bank. Mm. Uh, and But I had to quickly find some work, right? Um, Beijing is not a cheap city, even though I was living for free at my new girlfriend's house. Sure. So tell me about that transition. I can imagine, I've, ne- I've never been to Beijing. I've never been to China. Yeah. <laughs> from, from what I've seen coming from somewhere like Guatemala um, or even kind of uh, like where you grew up as well, I I can imagine that there was some fairly significant differences. So kind of tell me about that that bedding in period. Yeah, you nailed it. It could be overwhelming. Um, That that aspect of China life, I'll admit, even six years later, we split our year here every year. It's still tough for me. You know, every every green light people are running across the street. You know, in in Beijing, there's literally every one minute a subway train would roll up at the subway station and it would be jammed absolutely full. Not not like the seats are full, but like full, the volume is stuffed to capacity with human bodies uh, every minute. And it just, it it was definitely stunning at first. Um, And and that's cool because everything has pros and cons. So, um, I tried to find my way and the way I found it was through the little thing I could offer, which was my language. Uh, And at the time, and still today in China, English is a skill. Uh, People want to learn it. People want to pay for it. And children, adults, all ranges. So I experimented with which bracket I felt comfortable teaching in it first because that was the quick low-hanging fruit Mm -hmm. uh, before I got my first remote gig. Mm -hmm. So what did you end up kind of moving into for for your translation work or for your English teaching? What did that look like? Yeah, I mean, I I did some agency English teaching. I I went for one morning into a classroom of 50 kids and was like, yep, still not for me. Uh, (laughs) Not doing that. Uh, I, yeah. I had done some of that volunteer English teaching at different points and I already knew it wasn't for me, but I was willing to try again. Uh, and then I was cruising classifieds in an English language job board called the Beijinger. I think it still exists. I'm glad you, and I uh, fa- I'm glad you finished that sentence with, uh, with the uh, English translation job boards. Like when somebody says cruising classifieds, I'm like, Oh, where is this, where is this going? <laughs> what? I was only there with my new girlfriend. That would be appropriate, right? Uh, uh, yeah, no. So far, no, no worries on infidelity. Uh, so, um, and and I came across this gig. You know, my my Chinese isn't good enough to do the translation, but they had that part handled. They just needed someone with English to polish it up, and they needed it snappy because it was news cycle stuff. It was a niche. And automotive industry news, and they wanted it done within a three hour window, mm-hmm. um, which probably sounds crazy to some, but hey man when you're when you're new like it it worked it was and it was good money to me i thought it was it was twenty to twenty five bucks per hour more or less you know um and we did it by word, and he, the guy was super fair and 
uh, it was exciting to me. It was minuscule. It was like five hours a week, probably. Mm -hmm. Uh, But it was a start. Sure. So what, what kind of led you to explore other opportunities then? Obviously, you're making some income, you have very low... Uh, low overheads in terms of your your rent's already being paid for, but yeah, I guess right. there's, only, there's only so much you can kind of sponge off somebody and 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 still yeah. maintain a, a healthy relationship. Yeah, right. So I was still transitioning, um, and I had my last seasonal gig lined up for three months later in California. I really, I really was endeared to those people. It was, it's a nonprofit serving like at-risk youth. And I was heading up their kitchen as like the kitchen coordinator. Um, so I knew I was going to be physically transient again. And we had this plan for my partner to come meet me in the US and then we were going to go traveling together. So I didn't want to ditch that gig. It was so minimal, five hours, I could keep it up. Mm-hmm. Um, and then with our new plan and she was going to keep working and I didn't want to keep being a sponge. It was like, I think this is the answer. I don't think, you know, I, I tried looking for some physical location gigs in different places. And I found like be a hostel manager or like, but it just didn't seem like it would transfer well if we wanted to pick up and go. So then I finally realized like a, a clunky old laptop might be the portal that I needed at the time uh, to make that transition. And like I said, I was kind of growing up and growing out of, you know, a guy six years out of college still hadn't ever had a salary gig or, or things like that. So needless, needless to say, but I'll say it, my family was absolutely relieved when I met this person because <laughs> she helped me. Not that she told me to, but she helped me see for myself. Like, all right, I, I got to play catch up game in this one aspect of life. Sure. I suppose that, like for me, I would almost say it depends, it depends on your goals, right? Because I think yeah. there are plenty, plenty of people that make that lifestyle work for them and that's, that's what they want to do. But a lot of the time people have other priorities as well. And say, for example, that sort of lifestyle doesn't really lend itself to family life uh, at all. Um, just no. in terms of the the amount of money that you have coming in is fine for one person. If you watch if you watch what you spend, if you live quite a frugal lifestyle, you know you can still afford to go out for like drinks uh, occasionally with people. If you go to the right places and have food, yes. <laughs> but you're you're not you know splurging it up the wall, are you? It's very much no. like watching watching the purse strings quite carefully but enough to get by sort of thing what it doesn't do is give you the money and the resources to be able to um provide for for any children um you know without without you know being in some kind of serious like i don't know like financial edge i suppose it can be quite difficult it doesn't give you the money to feel good about your wife taking some time off um, to, to maybe help raise raise the, the children, not go straight back to work if, if that's something that she wants to do. So I totally get it. I think some people can make it work. I just think that lifestyle is kind of incompatible, um, you know, working kind of five, six hours or something like that. I think it's quite incompatible if you also have these other goals. Yeah. And just to be fair, I I would never trade that time of my life for anything. Uh, You know, cultural insights, languages. uh, I, I got to do so many very fulfilling things for me as a person. And I, I hoped I was helping some other people at some of these volunteer projects. And then it just became apparent all the things you said, you know, I, I, I occasionally saw like a hippie couple with their, you know, barefoot four-year-old. And it felt like that could be me. You know, now I've got a five-year-old and a two-month-old and it's just, it's just not going to work. Like I I still need to play catch-up game to try to uh, hope to buy a house one day for my kids so you can go to a good school. Uh, So if I had put it off even another couple of years, we'd we'd be in a bad situation, I, I think. As far as doing right by my kid long term, I still want him to 
have some exposure to nature and gardening. But, you know, this way is working too. He, he's fluent in two languages. And as he gets older, he'll understand more and more the nuances of the cultural differences, you know, like to be able to explain it to other people. He definitely understands them better than I do mm. uh, as it is, you know. So it's interesting. It's, you know, it, it is what it is. Sure. So tell me, uh, tell me a little bit about your, your, your first step into, I think, what a lot of copywriters and content creators would call almost a rite of passage. And that's uh, yeah. uh, content mills, those sorts of, yes. you know, volume <laughs> incentivized gigs, we'll call them for now. Yeah. I mean, it didn't take long, right, um, for me to be a super productive member of one or two content mills. Uh, it, it really didn't because we lived in Cancun for five months. Lo and behold, everything was so wonderful. We made our first kid. Uh, and then it was like, wow, I need to actually work <laughs> very, very much so right now. Uh, and so I was doing $12 blogs. Uh, it wasn't that long ago in my life where I would be sitting in a Beijing Starbucks pumping out 10 to $12 blogs, uh, literally like 20 to 30 a day, like 15,000 words, um, just cranking them out stream of consciousness. And I was, I was proud of myself for the ability to provide my end financially. Um, again, my, my partner still had her salary job at that point. She did go back to work three months after giving birth, which neither of us wanted, but I didn't start early enough to make that possible. Um, and but I definitely wasn't proud of the type of work. So rite of passage is spot on. I mean, we were doing what are considered, you know, trash articles for purely a backlink play and SEO. It's, it's all to boost people to the top of Google. Uh, nobody actually reads these articles and they're about things that nobody cares about. Um, so if you did stumble onto an article by accident, I'm sorry to you. Uh, <laughs> just, uh, it, yeah, it's tough. And you know, the other end of the spectrum is, as I'm sure many of you listening know, like $500,000 articles about things that matter to certain audiences that actually push people to do what the client wants. So and it's, it, it wasn't especially gratifying, but it felt like a means to an end at the time. Sure. No, it's, it's a good thing to get like the first step on the ladder and kind of understand what is out there, what is possible. Um, and hopefully like there'll be people listening that have maybe started on there and then don't know what to do next. And they can maybe, you know, perhaps follow your footsteps or, or something like that. It, for me, it was, it was something that I've heard about a lot um, from, from many different people. So I know it's, it is that rite of passage for, for a lot of people. I, I never did that. It was, it was quite interesting. I suppose it's because I, I found copywriting and, and content strategy and content creation, which is more what I'm moving into these days, very, very late in my career, not on a grand That's scale right. of things, but just later than most, most people in terms of relative, uh, relative terms. Because by the time I, I moved into, into that, I already had 10 years of digital marketing experience under my belt. You know, I'd, I'd already worked in paid social, you know, managing up to kind of a couple hundred grand in, in spend a month. I'd already been involved in PPC and SEO, and we'll come back to that obviously in, in a second. And then finally into conversion rate optimization and email automation and, and stuff like that. So I was in this quite strange position where actually like I kind of skipped a lot of the beginning steps in, in copywriting and, and content creation because I was, I was in this weird phase where, you know, I, I was a freelancer already, had been for a couple of years and I could command what I consider like good, good rates, good hourly rates, good project rates within digital marketing. And then I had this moment where I was like, well, I'm probably going to have to go down a little while you know, when I move into, into content creation and copywriting, because, you know, while I'm experienced in digital, I'm not that experienced in producing this sort of stuff. You know, it's an entirely different ball game. But then I, I quickly realized that the background that I had was actually 
completely an asset. And I could almost skip the beginning stages, firstly, because I knew how to make freelancing work. I, I made the realization, even before I moved into this, that the people that earn the most aren't necessarily the best um, at actually producing the outcomes that people, people want. Um, that's not to say that those people that, you know, haven't earned their money and don't do good work, but like the best copywriters, for example, aren't necessarily the ones that earn the most money. The ones that earn the most money are the ones that run their freelancing business like a business, not like they're a, a freelancer. So I kind of was able to skip a lot of these a lot of the, what people consider like the beginning and, and then the kind of, you know, the first and the second steps, which was quite nice because I was able to apply these principles in, in different ways. Like, and I realized a lot of copywriting in particular is about frameworks. You know, it's, it's about thinking, okay, what format is needed here? What knowledge of human psychology is needed and what order should we put that in? And then once you combine that with a decent research process, you're able to like jump light years ahead of people who are trying to work it out bit by bit, aren't using kind of mentors and communities and existing resources to help them grow. You're able to like just, just make a jump. So as I say, my point was I never kind of hit those content mills, but I know a lot of people that that have. <laughs> yeah, they're... And that, you know, I unfortunately for myself learned the hard way. And that's what I try to tell people what you said. I, I personally don't have the skill set that you have. However, a lot of people really could skip those stages with even just the right positioning, as you said, to manage themselves as a business, not as, I mean, it's like romance, right? Like you don't, you don't want to come off desperate. Uh, you need to come off as on solid footing uh, and it changes the ball game right from the get go. Yeah, definitely. It's, it's kind of this understanding that like that mindset shift of I'm not a single person here as a freelancer. Like I might call myself a freelancer, but realize it, I, I run a freelancing business, you know, and it, as soon as you have that mindset shift, it's so important because you suddenly have these situations crop up almost every day where you would handle it slightly differently as a freelancer versus a, a business owner, which is what I, obviously what I consider myself. I, I own multiple businesses, but when I'm talking about the freelancing business, it is a business. Like It's the same thing. Would people kind of, when they're talking about prices, um, would they expect a business to lower their prices and give you a discount just because they asked for it? No, they wouldn't. Right. And in the same, the same respect, I don't ever discount my work in terms of the amount of work that I do for the amount of money that I charge. I might give them a discount in terms of um, uh, like an incentive. Okay, this is your budget. And I'm not going to lower what I charge for the work, but I might do less work. I might say, okay, within that budget, you can't afford to hire me to do X, Y, and Z. We're just going to do X and Y, for example. Yeah. And that's kind of how that works. But the mindset shift between, you know, thinking of yourself as a, just as a single person, a single entity versus you are the business owner. You need to make sure that the, the revenue coming in is solid. You need to take a, a good hard look at your costs and things like that and grow the business. Um, it also, the most important thing I think for me in that mindset shift is how you think about growth. So if you think of yourself as a freelancer, then you might be content to just kind of take whatever projects come in the door. Um, you might not spend like a set amount of time each week on actually growing your business. You might just um, spend your time uh, fulfilling the, the client work that you've got, right? You might think that that's the priority. But if you think of yourself as a business owner, suddenly you realize, hang on, if I'm not spending a solid amount of time each week growing the business, that business will die. You know, you'll get turnover within your clients um, for whatever reason, it's not always down to like the quality of your work. A lot of the time yeah. when you lose a client, it's completely out of your control. 
it tends to be like a new marketing director comes in and wants to put their stamp and appoint an old agency, or they want to go in a different direction or that that project becomes less of a priority. And I just think that that mindset means that you you switch and you think, hang on, I need to be putting at least one to two days in a week, like working on my business, not working in my business. It has to be whatever number you choose, one to two days a week, one to three hours a week, whatever. It, it has to be consistent. You can't ever stop. You, If you sacrifice it, you will unfortunately find the payout in the end. I mean, you, you will catch yourself without work at some point. Uh, you really can't stop. So it, yeah, I completely agree with you. And I, I really did learn that the hard way multiple times, uh, get, get complacent, feel like I've got the right set of clients. Oh, what do you know? My handler at that company just switched jobs and they're going to bring an in-house person in. Doesn't mean I, like you said, that I did a bad job. I actually did a great job. They, they got a new round of fundraising or whatever, and they were enabled to get in-house employees. So that's, uh, yeah, you, you can't take any of this personally, but what you're talking about here is dollars, uh, revenue. You made a great point about, is it healthy revenue or, or is it actually a liability, this new project? You know, is it a good use of your time? So yeah, these are, these are lessons that for me, it took me a long time or say long, you know, I have only been a business owner a few years, but uh, it, it felt like a long time because it's really painful when you when you're learning these. That's it. Yeah, time time seems to slow when you're going through these issues. It's slowed uh, down a hell of a lot. <laughs> so tell me, uh, tell me how you how about the move from content mill to to content agency? Yes. So I was doing these. Uh, I was doing a lot of these blog posts for a big name, Groupon, um, and they they were a little amateur hour in that they literally would show everyone like your payroll for the month. And it was very easy to calculate just how many of them they were doing per month. Um, and, you know, this was through an intermediary. I don't want me to put this on group on that. The, the amateur hour was the intermediary, the, mm-hmm. the content agency. Um, and my, my co-founder at Jolly Morgan, Taylor, he's my friend since high school, uh, I roped him into this. You know, this was his first step. Unfortunately, he didn't know Nelson Jordan. He actually knew Greg Heiler. So I was like, "You could too could be a content mill writer." <laughs> so that's where he started, uh, and he's still grateful for it. But again, he doesn't know you. He knows me, unfortunately. So uh, then he did the math and was like, "You're a, Greg already alone doing forty percent of these. Like, if we just..." told them we could handle 100% and they don't have to deal with managing the freelance writers, I think they'd go for it. And of course they went for it. So we took on 100% of it. Um, I had previously, you know, with my Chinese work, occasionally bit off these huge one-off projects, like 100,000 words of editing. And so I'd find a couple other people to sub some parts out to. Uh, And that was the start of the dream of like kicking back on the beach um, and letting everyone do the work. And it was also the start of a really, really hard two years of learning about margin as a business owner. So uh, that, that was the start. This, this, uh, we did 4,002 uh, on-site pages for Groupon on our first project. Uh, and I, I would love to tell a funny story, if you don't mind, at my expense. Oh, of um, we paid... At the tail end of that, a very reasonable fee to a mentor. And he told us the truth, which was, you got that gig from doing however many it was. I can't even remember the number. Let's say 50 50 blogs a month Mm -hmm. for a year for this SEO agency. Um, And our idea was to recreate that project you know, multiple times, $50,000 project, we were just going to sell at least one of these a month and be set for life. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, and he said to us, you did this for like a year with this agency. That's why they gave you the project. What in the world makes you think you're going to cold pitch this to SEO agencies left and right out there that your crew is going to take on these $50,000 projects for them. Mm. Uh, and uh, we thought, now we've we've got four thousand pages done for Groupon. Like nothing will stop us here. 
Uh, and it was a really brutal year and a half after not listening to that advice because that did not happen. We did not, we never got one of those projects again as a content agency. Uh, and instead we basically became what I call a mid tier content agency, almost like a mid tier freelancer. Mm -hmm. You know, we shopped our portfolio around, we begged for trials, uh, we'd get dropped for reasons totally out of our control. Uh, CRO wasn't on point, promotion didn't exist, things like that. And, uh, yeah, it was, it, it was a, a misadventure with a lot of lessons. Sure. So it sounds like it's, it can be in, incredibly painful. Those, those transition periods, I'm going to call them, um, yeah. where you're just basically trying to figure stuff out. Um, you're trying to come at it with some sort of process and some sort of logic and discipline. But at the same time, some of it is just picking these ideas that you have, throwing, at the, throwing them at the wall and seeing what sticks. Um, there's an element of that as well. Like it's, it's the reason, you know, that I, speaking from a personal perspective that, yeah, I feel comfortable with my direction now, but you know, there's still things going on that I'm trying to figure out, but that's only because, uh, you know, I 10 years of experience at doing different things, trying out different things, you know, at, there was, there were times that I thought, you know what, I'm going to create my own social media agency, um, you know, and, and grow that and bring on all, all of these fancy clients and stuff. And then I very much found that, you know, I am still involved in social media now, but I do from a, a strategy perspective, you know, I, I don't enjoy a lot of the things that go on from a day-to-day -day perspective with that. So I don't necessarily want to want to grow that arm of my, my business anymore. Um, and then you've got, you know, other things like I was involved in PPC for a long time. And now I don't, I don't manage PPC for anyone, not because, you know, I'm, I'm not good at it, but because I don't feel like I, that's where I do my best work. And I didn't, I didn't learn about that through, through anything other than experimentation through trying it out for a yeah. couple of years, learning, you know, all, all of the, the, the basic principles, getting better, working on different clients, only at the end of it to be like, I don't really enjoy doing this. Um, and you, yeah, you could view that as a couple of years wasted, or you can view that as, okay, that's lots of transferable skills. I still was working with uh, a lot of great clients during the time, improving my client management, uh, my my internal like management of myself and uh, and other people, um, and then kind of move on, and then just put that down as to part of the path that you had to tread to kind of find what you you do like doing. That's what I think is beautiful. I, when you said transferable skills, I was kind of sitting on that one. Uh, it's at least for me that's. That's how it worked out, you know, just a little tweak on those, at that point, four years of firsthand experience uh, and both in executing and managing a team. And then all of a sudden it turned into the right model. Uh, so, and like you said, you know, you, you leapfrogged the early stages of copywriting because you had several skill sets and you're in, I mean, if you know CRO, you're a copywriting client's dream. Uh, that's you know, they don't know these things. That's, that's what they think they're getting out of a copywriter. But when they get a GDoc full of words and the person didn't actually know CRO, then it's like, it's a, it's a nice text document, but it's, it's not really going to do what they hoped it would do, which is make them money. Exactly. It's, it's, it's interesting. And uh, it's very much, as you say, like I wouldn't trade those times at all. Um, there are very few experiences, even, you know, I, I think at the, the beginning of my career, my first kind of full-time job, uh, I did this, the same thing as your wife, very much moved to the big city, moved to London as, you know, a lot, lots of people do. And, uh, I worked as a recruitment consultant, uh, I stayed in that job for six months, which I thought, uh, I always knew I was going to quit it because I hated mm. it. Um, you know, it, it gave me mouth ulcers. It was incredibly stressful. It was incredibly long hours. I, I, I didn't like what I was doing. And also I was very bad at it, you know, like 
I, I was not good at some robotic, monotonous, cold calling um, sort of thing. I hated bothering people, you know? I, I, I genuinely would feel quite apologetic for calling people. Um, so yeah. I was not meant to do that. But it took me... Uh, it took it took me that time to to learn what I don't like doing, you know, and, and like I would never do a job like that, like a corporate job, you know, a job that expects me to rock up every day in a suit, a tie, and a blazer. That's that's not me. Um, a suit that expects me to be clean shaven, um, guys. If you're listening to this on the podcast rather than YouTube channel, um, it's been a little while since I've been clean shaven. <laughs> Uh, normally rocking a, a bit of a beard. Um, but yeah, so before we get too, too off track talking about my story, which I'm sure people have heard uh, multiple times. So you're in this kind of mid-tier kind of content agency as you described it. Obviously these days your jolly is more oriented around link building. What was the kind of trigger that made you think maybe maybe there's a, a better way uh, a way that we're more in tune with of doing this uh what is that necessity is, is the mother of invention or something like that uh you know jolly content as we were called then wasn't making me personally money everyone was getting paid morgan and i weren't uh maybe we were making like 10 bucks an hour so i was still freelancing on the side mm -hmm. and i'd stumbled into what isn't copywriting, but media pitches is almost like a hybrid. There's a little bit of direct response in there, but it also really satisfied my, you know, I have a history bachelor's degree uh, and I did a lot of content. So I like research. And you, when you send these media pitches, you're sending authoritative content. Uh, and I was ghostwriting these for a couple of clients personally. Would you... um? Just uh, sorry to jump in there, Greg. For anybody that doesn't no, no. doesn't know what media pitches are, um, because they yeah, have them themselves, me. would you be able to just give us a, a short background on that? Yeah, let's say you're reading an article. Let's pick the most probably well known one that my company does today is like Business Insider, right? Uh, let's say you're reading an article on there, and they quote three to four experts, right? Literally quotation marks around their sentence said so-and-so CEO of company name. Mm -hmm. So to get that quote, probably the freelance writer who has the byline put it through what is called a journalism sourcing service. Uh, and these are platforms. The one that we use most commonly known is called Haro, Help a Reporter Out. Uh, it's, it's a wonderful platform if you want to check it out. Uh, and they just put a little what's called a query on there and say, hey, Oh, sorry about the background noise for you and your team. Um, they put a little what's called uh, uh, like summary description uh, and say, I'm writing an article on remote work and I'm looking for experts to contribute their thoughts, right? So what I would do on behalf of clients and what Jolly SEO is built on today is we're not spinning up fabrications, right? We're we're using our firsthand experience or maybe our company's uh, experience, but we're also not promoting. These are media pitches, but it's not like product promotion pitches. Mm. Uh, and we're contributing that those quotes. That's what the, these media publications are looking for. They're looking for valuable contributions they'd actually want in their article. Uh, so that was something I personally was doing for a full year before I turned to Morgan and said, like, this is it. This is the one. Like, we shut down the content agency. Clients need this. Um, they're founders. They're C-suites. They can't write like we can. Uh, they don't have time, maybe. Maybe they can do it. But um, they're willing to pay way better than the mid-tier blogs we did. And the results were so tangible compared to our articles that would sit in the back of a blog directory somewhere uh, on their site. These were on publications they want their name in. Mm -hmm. uh, and then we get into SEO with a backlink. Sure. So uh, for, for those that uh, aren't aware then, other than people seeing their name in the publication, what is the value of a backlink from somebody like Business Insider to your website? Yeah. So there's these things, um, 
you know, in Google, every time if you use Google, you look for something, there's what they call a search engine result page, the SERPs, right? And so everybody's trying to climb to the top. Obviously, there's some ads at the top, but everyone's trying to climb to the top of the organic results. And the way you get there is a few different, it could be a lot of different, we don't actually know, um, factors. And the most commonly known ones are the links you have, both the quantity and the quality, so where they're coming from, uh, and then content on your site, how authoritative it is, um, and there's other things like user experience. So my little company, we just focus on a subset of that one factor links, which is, you know, we're not looking for toxic stuff. We're not going to any dodgy sites. We're actually not even proactively pitching these people. We're waiting for them to put out a call for help and we go straight as our clients. Uh, and like you said, yeah, the quote is good, but actually the majority that our clients want is that link mm -hmm. from an authoritative site, which tells Google, wait a minute, this big site thinks this little site is legitimate. And so maybe we'll push them a little higher over someone else who doesn't have that little bit of indicator from an authoritative site. Mm -hmm. So the way I understand it, then you work on behalf of, you know, these uh, corporate entities, these, these companies and businesses that want to increase their traffic to their website and they want to gain more links from what they call like authoritative uh, websites, these industry publications like Forbes, like Business Insider, um, th those sort of publications, um, because that will bring them increased traffic because of the links. Yes. I think your elevator pitch is a little better than mine. You are the copywriter, so I, I could probably... <laughs> no, if you could just clip this and then I'll, we'll transcribe we'll, it. And we'll, uh, we'll, it we'll clip it up <laughs> and send it. Uh, it's, it's, it's essentially just, I, as I said, I've been involved in SEO for, for many years and link building, weirdly, is the one... like Because I've been involved in so many aspects of digital marketing... And even like within SEO, I've um, worked, worked with clients to Im improve their organic, increase their organic traffic and the conversions that come from organic as well. But the one thing that I've, I haven't done and hasn't really appealed to me is to go kind of all in on, on link building for, for any particular time. I've built my own links for my own website. I've used um, Harrow before as well, the helper reporter out. Um, I've secured several links to that for, from my site by using the exact same thing that, that you do. So I know that well. It's just I've never been that involved in a, a link building um, you know, team or anything like that or a, or a project that was essentially just centered around that. So I find it really, really interesting. One of the things that I'd like you to comment on, um, just because you're perfectly placed to do so, is that I found with Haro a lot of the times I just never heard back from, from people. You know, I, there was a very kind of low success rate. And I'm interested in hearing whether that was because I was not doing it as optimally as I, I, I could do, which I suspect might be some of it, as opposed to like professionals like you guys who do it all day, every day. Um, but also I got the feeling that you you have to create a lot of these in the first place to kind of increase your chances of, of being picked up by one of these publications. Is that true? There is a numbers game aspect. Uh, so the results on our team varies. You know, I, when I used to actively pitch, I was like a one in four and a half was my, was my conversion ratio. Our, our head of the program right now is similar uh, and he hasn't pitched in a few months. So, but that was what he wrapped up at. But our team spans from like one in seven to one in 15, really, mm -hmm. our active team. Anybody higher than that, we usually end up, they, they don't, it doesn't work for them and it doesn't work for us. I'll put it that way. Mm -hmm. um, so, but yeah, it, it's not, that's the most common thing I see, um, you know, for SEOs who are used to link building, they're used to paying their way into articles. Mm -hmm. So they're used to literally sending an email saying, I'd like to be on your site. Um, so that has a pretty low conversion ratio when you're dealing with a freelance journalist who is like, I've got a deadline in six hours. Like I needed 
the contribution one way, like in my inbox. Mm -hmm. Um, So there's definitely nuances to it. But the most common I see is people give up after trying 20 times uh, because they... They, they're just so used to sending those like, I'll give you money. Uh, that, that usually works pretty well uh, mm-hmm. on the right sites. Um, but I think if people can be a little more patient, um, it's, there's also a delay factor. You might have more wins than, than you realize because they take 24 hours to five months to go live. Mm-hmm. Uh, so you might have more than you realize. Um, and Haro at least in particular, you don't get notified of your wins 90 plus percent of the time. So unless you're someone like you who really knows SEO and is crawling for the results, uh, you might have some out there. That's something we've learned, of course, as a pay for results only business. But yeah, long answer short, like one to seven and one, one in 15, somewhere in there, if you're in there, you're doing okay, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. But is that worth it for your time? You know, that's for you being the CRO guy to, to think about uh, sure. ROI on your time. And, that, and that's, that's the outcome that I had. And I, I guess that's why if, even somebody like me who knows that side of things um, and understands the value of those links versus the time, I decided at the end of it, it wasn't worth uh, my time. And I think that's like where your company, your agency comes in. You know? Yeah. Yeah. Um, to to outsource that process because it's still very valuable and the links are it's just kind of that trade off of of time and do do you want as a, a freelancer or as a business owner do you want to get good at this um do you want to start off at like uh getting a one in 15 success rate for your pitches and then increase that to like a seven one in seven or one in six or one in five or whatever um is is that worth it with your time that you'd have to spend versus you know writing and researching what else could you do in your business with that time and i think that's where you guys come in and super valuable when you mentioned um it not being right for for some people in terms of the people actually working for you for jolly seo the freelancers that you hire is that because you you pay them per successful link oh we do a combination so roughly, and again, depends on their conversion ratio, but roughly half their pay comes from the success and half from the pitching. Mm -hmm. So we do per pitch and then per success. And we even tier the compensation on the success because uh, we learned this early on that lo and behold, uh, freelancers are good at finding the easy wins. And those aren't always the same ones the clients want to win. Mm. So we had to 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 fix our quality. It was about April or May was the low point of our quality in 2020. Mm. Uh, and around April or May, we instituted tiered compensation internally. And you know, I talked about the delay and win. So it took a couple months to swing back, but our quality is a- almost as good as it gets without us being like a unprofitable company, you know, and like doubling up uh, our compensation on that. But we, we pay pretty good for the high quality wins. Mm -hmm. uh, And then we just, we pay a decent rate for the, for the low quality from our perspective. We, we aim for, if you know, SEO DR 50 and above, that's Mm -hmm. all we pay for. So that's still um, very, that's still very high. Um, Because we're done for you, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, nobody's, Nobody's going to pay what we charge for lower than that. Um, and it's once a month now we see people with the same exact position as us emerge. Two, two of our clients just forwarded me a cold email <laughs> today from someone undercutting our price, but with the same messaging, pitching them. Uh, so it's, it works because of that cutoff. Because anything less, maybe they would want to get good at it themselves or, or find a solo freelancer to get good at it over time. I mean... The, the two initial clients who took a chance on me, um, but that's that's exactly what they were doing. You know, we were all just kind of rolling the dice, and luckily it worked. So I, I'm very, very, very grateful for those two initial clients. Uh, I really, really appreciate them. Two years later, we're still together. So it's yeah, it, it's it's not for everyone. It's definitely not for every 
business owner, C-suite, uh, at that point, you're doing a lot of things that to, are, are, are writing these media pitches worth your time. I, I don't write my own, you know? I have a ghostwriter on our team do them now. Uh, so it's, yeah, it's just a formula you have to work out uh, on your time. Definitely. So within your, uh, your, your kind of pool, I suppose, of freelance writers, um, where, where are they typically based? Oh, we are probably like 80% North America. Mm-hmm. Um, and then we've got probably like 10% across Europe, but they seem to be British. Just, they just, they just have, you know, done the whole like Spain, Portugal thing or something like that. Um, and then we actually do have a wonderful team member in Kenya and a couple in the Philippines. Um, I am just so sympathetic being, you know, I know a few languages, but none of them good enough to work professionally in. And I feel bad. Whereas at, at Jolly Content, where we had an in-house editor, we could always accommodate ESL up to an extent. Mm-hmm. Um, ghostwriting C-suite executives from usually America, and there's no time for editing. Uh-huh. Uh, it's been really hard to accommodate and we've had to turn away a lot of otherwise great writers. But if the cultural fit wasn't there with the written language, we just, we just couldn't make it work. Sure. I, I like, I, I totally get that. There's a difference between being like proficient in a language and knowing like all the idioms, um, you know, all the, the, it, it's the, the idioms. specific it phrases just... and just things like tone of voice as well for for, for these sort of things is, is, is really, really hard to gauge when you're talking as a, like using it as a foreign language. So yeah, I there's, totally there's another that. one. There's one that, that surprised me a lot and I should have known better because I'm in China and culture is different in every place. Mm-hmm. Uh, we are ghostwriters. So we need to be ultra respectful of these fine lines and they're really fine lines on bounding the gray area of what's permissible. Uh, they're super fine. And sometimes people from different cultures have different definitions of what's acceptable mm. to say. And so we had a couple instances where it was like, oh my gosh, I cannot believe, like, despite the thorough video based training the one-on-one hour-long onboarding calls, the hands-on-hand coaching, you know, despite all that, I'd see it live on the internet, my client saying something, and I think, I I just, now I got to go in damage control mode. I can't believe that, Mm. uh, that my company helps put that out there. And that isn't good PR for me to be saying on this, but it's just a lesson learned in terms of, I guess, you know, as much as you want to, try to push boundaries uh, sometimes uh, you just gotta know that there really are boundaries uh, and for us it's been okay like we we almost have to stick to this subset of writers uh, even though there's amazing writers everywhere there's uh, there's only so much that you can cover in training right you're yeah. you're trying to provide like the, the process for them and the the resources to get better. But it, at the end of the day, like they still have your, your training, which might be however many hours and I might go over this period versus a lifetime of existing in inside a particular culture and which is going to win out. Like I, we, we <laughs> both know the answer there. Um, yeah. So yeah, that's, that, that makes sense. Um, one thing I just wanted to, to, to kind of talk about now is um, just before we wrap up is, is work, work-life balance. In our, mm-hmm. in our discovery call, you mentioned that, you know, you're working incredibly long hours until quite, quite recently, you know, standard for, yes. for kind of startup founders um, yes. seems, seems to be. Um, what was your kind of incentive to, or your realization that you were perhaps putting in too many hours and your incentive to, to change your behavior? Well, I mean, it's cliche. Uh, and I'm not going to say this was the only thing that did it, but my, my then four-year-old, he just turned five, son really did 
tell me that I like work more than him. So it's a uh, it's exactly exactly what I told myself proactively before ever having a child that I would never be that kind of parent. Mm-hmm. Um, let alone whatever your image of a of father versus mother is. You know, I don't I I don't appreciate when parents are on their cell phones around their kids. Uh, and I've absolutely had my laptop on my lap with him yeah. next to me and told him like give me two minutes to do this and then spend 12 minutes instead uh so yeah i think that um it's just unsustainable too you know i i I have a newborn now um and so we're heading back to america in four weeks in january 2021 and the good news is things like that actually will force me to delegate better uh, because I'm only going to have 10 hours a week to work until we find a preschool, those things like that. Uh, so yeah, it, it definitely was just the end of a long run of a few years. You know, we're fortunate. My wife hasn't had to work in several years um, and gotten to be with our kid, which we think is more valuable than anything possible. Uh, mm-hmm. But I, I would like to be part of their lives too uh and so um i think maybe it goes in you know the work side satisfaction wise i feel very good about how we're serving our clients and so that is satisfying however you know i shared on this podcast my life before this was very different and for me i know I won't be happy if I spend another five years staring at a computer screen as the majority of my waking hours. Mm -hmm. So, um, and that's, that's not to say that I feel so entitled. I don't think I should work. I think that, um, at, at some point I have to figure out that balance of, you know, how to keep working digitally, but also find, find some way to half step back into something that really satisfies me personally uh, not just satisfies me in terms of serving other people, which is is wonderful. But you know, you you've got to got to take care of yourself for the long run too. No, I, I totally get that. I'm I'm having uh, some considerations really this this whole year. Um, but I, I have a lot to... of people, right? Yeah, and I think for for me, um, as well as doing kind of taking on more more projects that do have an impact, um, you know, by the time this goes out, um, you know, I, I might have, um, it's, 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 it's hard, it's hard to say, but I'm, I might be in a position where I'm, I'm kind of the, the CMO or part-time CMO of a, a company that is helping people to, to kind of transition in their career. We'll see if that kind of comes, comes to pass, but the main thing for me is finding stuff that is completely outside of digital. Um, and for me, that's likely to be coaching rugby. Um, you know, I, I grew up playing rugby. Uh, I unfortunately had to, to stop in my early twenties after neck injuries and, and, uh, quite a few concussions, uh, I had more concussions than I should have before I learned my lesson and, and stopped playing. Um, but it's something that I desperately miss. Um, and it's a great way to be involved um, with people and to form a community. And it's about uh, make, making friends in that area that, that aren't involved in the same things that I do on the day-to-day because the, the majority of my friends these days have the very, very similar lifestyles to me. You know, They're not necessarily working from home, but they're involved in the digital or PR industries or they're people who I meet through, through the podcast. Um, so for me, like getting to know people outside and, and people involved in like my local community, you know, I, I moved from my wife and I moved from Valencia, Spain to, um, to Staffordshire. It's kind of slap bang in the, the middle of the UK, beautiful place. Um, but I, especially because of coronavirus, we don't know many people here at the moment, like we're not as involved in the community as I would like. So that's kind of my goal for 2021. Um, so I totally get that. Uh, Greg, thank you. Thank you so, so much for, for coming on. It's been fantastic to hear how you've gone from kind of uh, a, a farmer to a, a content mill writer to being involved in, in digital in terms of link building. 
where can uh, people find both yourself and, and Jolly SEO? Where's, where's the best place to go? You know, I think on LinkedIn, Greg, and then my last name is H-E-I-L-E-R-S. Uh, I'd be happy just to connect and, and we can, whether it's talk shop or as you said, talk about uh, life, I think for a lot of people is in transition in 2020 and 2021. Uh, and, you know, Jolly SEO is jollyseo.co, uh, just CO. Uh, and that's, yeah, that's, that's great for me. Uh, I'm happy to share more about what we do in terms of helping you do it yourself. There's, there's no real secrets. So um, thank you for having me. I appreciate it. You're very welcome. I enjoyed our conversation today. Yeah, me too. And that's it for today. You've been listening to the Working From Home podcast with me, Nelson Jordan. We've been talking about the good, the bad, and the ugly side of remote work. Thanks so much for listening, and I really hope you've enjoyed the time you've spent with us today. If you'd like to discuss the podcast, you want to make a new friend, or you're interested in working with me on a copywriting or digital marketing project, then visit nelson-jordan.com. That's nelson-jordan.com, where you can also sign up to my newsletter to hear about this podcast and other exciting projects. Until next week, goodbye. Goodbye.